Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm uh, delighted to, to, to welcome you to this uh, sixth edition of the Connect University Summer School. Established in uh, 2015, Connect University is the knowledge sharing flagship initiative of the European Commission's Directorate General on Communication Networks, Content and Technology. Uh, in short, DigiConnect, that aims to inform the public about the latest digital trends. Uh, Cutting-edge technologies placed high on the political agenda are presented with the scope to foster inspiration, identify current trends uh, and opportunities, while enabling synergies between various EU institutions, industry, academia, and international organizations. Uh, the Connect University project, in short, is a trademark for debates and policy advice, raising awareness about the ongoing digital revolution and preparing the society for the future changes. The special sixth edition focuses on digital for our planet, presenting how can digital technologies be harnessed to tackle climate change, both in terms of a greener digital system, as well as, uh, as, well as their role in helping reducing the carbon emissions across industries. All the sessions are recorded and can be reviewed afterwards directly on the Digital EU YouTube channel or on the Connect University web page in the video section. You can still register for the following sessions. The links are published on Slido. And don't forget about the certificates that you get if you attend more than seven lectures. For today's session on artificial intelligence for the Earth, we invite you to join us via Slido using the code artificial intelligence. I repeat, the code for Slido is artificial intelligence. You can comment and ask us questions and our moderator will allocate them accordingly to our speakers. Also, please use the hashtag ConnectUniversity when sharing insights on the event on social media. Without further ado, I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Yuha Heikila, head of unit from uh, DigiConnect A1 Robotics and Artificial Intelligence, Innovation and Excellence, who will be the moderator of the present event. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, good morning, everyone, also from my side. I'm very glad that you have joined this uh, Connect University session uh, with these uh, um, uh, distinguished speakers uh, that we have today to discuss um, uh, AI and its role in, um, in our um, uh, combat against climate change and related aspects. Um, I shall, to, to kick off this session, I shall give you some indication as to um, outline a bit what AI can do, what these aspects can help. Um, 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 fight to the climate change and deal with environmental aspects and thereby also to contribute to the European Commission, uh, and the EU Green Deal. Um, and uh, then after that, um, I will also give you some indication what we are already doing in this respect and what we are planning to do. And after that, then, of course, uh, uh, I will hand over to the main guests today to, to give their posi position and, and perspective on these aspects. Um, so let me then start uh, by outlining a bit what AI can do in this respect. Um, AI is a technology which will produce information that is relevant for environmental planning, decision making, and the management and monitoring of, uh, of progress of environmental policies. So it is a tool that will help uh, to take better decisions and to then also uh, guide the measures accordingly. So this policy function, this policy support function is one aspect of it. Of course, then AI can also steer and maintain systems, infrastructure and facilities, hazardous facilities as well, uh, in a better way. It can support us in, in that particular task. Um, and um, of course, this is based on the ability of AI to analyze large amounts of data and to increase our knowledge base uh, and thereby to tackle challenges better. This is especially powerful if AI technology is combined with Earth observation data, for example, um, because this enables more effective, efficient and timely monitoring of environmental impacts and trends, and this helps them to, to, to uh, gain new insights and, uh, pre and, and prepare predictions that will help us then to take measures accordingly. Um, but there are other aspects to this. 
So um, AI generated information can also help consumers and businesses to adapt towards uh, uh, behavioral patterns which are more sustainable. So it will help also through that uh, indirect effect, if you like. Um, and of course, this, uh, these kinds of effects can be seen in many different sectors. So you may have already thought about um, optimizing and monitoring energy consumption. That's obviously one very uh, clear application area, but there are many others. If you take, for example, manufacturing, um, it supports circular economy, it helps to, to optimize processes, um, it helps to, to uh, inspect and sort uh, and separate, um, uh, and it helps in dis disassembling processes to, to circulate materials in the economy. So in the manufacturing process, it will make them more efficient, uh, less wasteful of resources, and also uh, more energy efficient overall. Um, agriculture, agri-food is another area where there is obviously a lot to be gained in this regard from this technology. Um, uh, sustainable farming, sustainable production uh, based on precision farming, which takes advantage of AI techniques and robotics techniques. Um, it will help minimize waste. It will help also reduce the use of pesticides and fertilizers and thereby um, uh, reduce the environmental burden of, of, uh, of farming operations. Uh, smart communities, smart cities, obviously a, we already touched on the energy uh, aspects, but there are others, uh, traffic planning and management, um, coordination of different modes of transport, vehicle automation, uh, and of course, waste processing um, and uh, managing and operating utilities overall. Um, it can also help uh, make buildings more energy efficient, reuse heat, for example, um, and overall then thereby support uh, uh, our um, um, activities and measures in, um, in combating climate change. Um, of course, this technology also has a certain uh, environmental footprint itself. Um, it is obvious that some of these uh, te technologies that we deploy um, use a fair bit of energy. Um, so uh, hardware and the digital technologies that are deplo deployed, um, they like data centers and networks, they of course uh, uh, um, are uh, in need of resources. They need a lot of electricity. Um, and of course, given that this technology is getting more and more prevalent, uh, thereby of course also it is uh, expected to, to, to uh, follow a growing trend. So we expect uh, um, the, the, the effects of this technology to, to be growing if we don't do anything about it. It is estimated maybe um, uh, five to nine percent of uh, uh, total electricity use, uh, use is caused by ICT. Um, and then the overall uh, greenhouse gas emissions are estimated to be somewhere between just under 2% to just under 3%. Some estimates suggest that it's close to 4%. It is not so easy to measure, but it is um, obviously uh, um, it is obviously there. By comparison, of course, I mean there are uh, areas like transport, housing, which have a much higher uh, uh, share of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and transport, I think, is estimated to be around a quarter, and, and uh, buildings housing about uh, more than a third, I think. Nevertheless, this is potentially an increasing share, and thereby, therefore, we have to, to take this seriously uh, and make sure that uh, we also uh, have measures in place which limit the increase uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, ICT on. Uh, the impact of ICT on uh, on greenhouse gas emissions. So, what do we do then in this area? So, um, we have in fact um, quite a number of actions um, um, in our research and innovation program. Um, so, we specifically have um, in Horizon Europe the Future Research and Innovation Program. We have um, actions for AI for green. So, this is a, a new work program which has just been published. And it calls for research and innovation projects in this area specifically uh, uh, for, for to, to deploy AI and robotic technologies uh, for the Green Deal. 
so that's one very important aspect of it uh, and uh, uh, and we also but we also look at the greener AI aspects so we'll be looking at things that can make help make AI and ICT greener and thereby um, limit the increase it has on on greenhouse uh, gas emissions so we are looking at we are calling for also research and innovation projects in areas that help make AI systems more efficient. Um, so this could be through, for example, optimized learning, um, um, using scarce data or synthetic data, uh, um, using more energy efficient systems, and so on. Um, so these are some of the aspects that we have. We have already ongoing projects um, which are relevant to this uh, area. Uh, so we have, just to give you um, uh, an example, we have a project which is looking at optimization of, of renewable energy grids uh, and, and supporting them in the best possible way. This is a project which has only just started, uh, but it is looking at this, this very core of, of, uh, of activities that help combat the climate change. We have also um, a, a new project which is looking at uh, how to deploy robotic and AI technologies in the monitoring of natural habitats. Um, so these just by way of two examples of what we have. Um, there are others, for example, we have projects in uh, in the agri-food area, which is which are looking at uh, increased increasing the efficiency of farming operations and making them more sustainable. Um, so this is part of the research and innovation program that we have. Uh, crucially, also, we will be launching a new program, um, a deployment and capacity building program called Digital, Digital Europe, which has as one of its components testing and experimentation facilities. And we are planning to have these testing and experimentation facilities in four key sectors, um, uh, which are agri-food, smart communities, uh, manufacturing and health, and they look at precisely these kinds of environmental aspects as well. So the idea here is to uh, take research results and test them in close to real world environments in these facilities um, uh, and thereby then help them uh, become more mature and bring them closer to the market. And indeed here the, uh, uh, the, the environmental aspects are also part of it. Um, so this is part of the digital program that will be launched uh, shortly. Um, and there will be then a call for proposals coming up as well in that regard. Um, these programs, of course, are in the bigger context of the coordinated plan on artificial intelligence that we published, uh, the, the revision of that coordinated plan uh, in April. The first uh, edition was published already in December 2018. And this new uh, edition of the coordinated plan has a number of activities and actions for the Commission. Um, uh, to uh, to ensure that uh, the environmental aspects are taken into account in our activities. So the research and development aspects I already mentioned, um, and um, uh, but there are also uh, uh, actions that the Commission has undertaken uh, in in other respects. Uh, uh, for example, taking the environmental dimension into account in these digital Europe actions. Um, also beyond the uh, testing and experimentation facilities, um, creation of a, a data space, um, uh, um, um, Green Deal data space, which uh, I think you have heard about yesterday, and a number of other actions. So this is something where uh, it is a separate chapter in that uh, coordinated plan, so this was added to it uh, in that revision of the coordinated plan as, as a recognition of the importance of these particular aspects in this regard. Um, um, so we are looking at using deploying AI to, 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 to support the Green Deal, but we are also trying to make AI greener. And one aspect that I uh, should also mention is the hardware aspect. So we're also supporting and testing an experimentation facility in hardware Edge AI, which is more energy efficient and which will help then uh, lower en energy, the energy consumption of these systems. Finally, I should also mention that we are setting up we have set up a public-private partnership in AI data and robotics, um, and as part of its vision, uh, environmental aspects are also mentioned as one of the key uh, uh, components, one of the key aspects that it will look at. So this by way of a background, and um, I shall now then um, 
quickly introduce the, 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 the speakers. Uh, we have a, a very exciting lineup of speakers today. Um, we have Philip Singer, uh, the Managing Director and Co-Finder of Leaders for Climate Action. Then we have Sylvia hietman stepien um, who is um, uh, the EU Government Affairs and Public Policy Manager at Google. Um, and then we have Alberto Arribas, uh, who is Microsoft Sustainability Science Lead for Europe. And the first speaker today will be uh, Philip Zinger. Um, uh, uh, Philip started his uh, first impact startup when he was 18, and he uh, imported fair traded and recycled bags from Cambodia, uh, investing uh, uh, part of the revenue also in drinking water projects. And for eight years now, he's been building companies with his co-founder. Co um, and after selling the first company, um, um, they decided to fully focus on the most pressing issues of our time, the climate crisis. Philip uh, is going to talk about why it uh, is necessary to have a global community to fight the climate crisis. So I'll hand over to Philip then. Uh, Philip, uh, it's, uh, the floor is yours. Uh. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. And first of all, I'm very thrilled to be here and, uh, to talk to such an interesting audience. Leaders for Climate Action, the nonprofit, is actually focusing fully on, on Europe right now. So therefore, I think it is, it is an amazing match. And I would love to kind of give you an overview of what we are doing at Leaders for Climate Action and also kind of tell you our learnings, how we are able to trigger transformation inside of organizations. And also then towards the end, uh, I brought one of the innovation projects that we're doing right now that is focusing really on a, on a clean digital infrastructure. So um, also maybe something that in, in, in the after, after, after the talks, we can catch up uh, in whichever way. But maybe we'll be starting with, with our approach and why we found this, found the leaders for climate action. Um, about two years ago, it was really, it was really this impulse that we, that we looked at the digital ecosystem or the tech ecosystem, and I have to say we were simply so disappointed that in, in regards of fighting the climate crisis, there was so much talking going on, and there was not enough action from company sides. And we really had this feeling that there was this mindset of pointing fingers at other industries that are maybe doing worse than the digital industry in terms of emissions. Let's take the oil and gas industry, let's take the flying industry, or even even transportation, um, and we, we, we just thought it's not the right mindset to just point fingers, but we really start in our, in our own companies and in our own ecosystem. And we, we thought that the digital industry really has a very interesting potential because we, we can really be the first ecosystem that operates completely climate neutral or climate positive, and at the same time brings about growing and healthy organizations. And we as leaders for climate action believe if, if we achieve this with our ecosystem, we can really put pressure on other industries to follow these examples. And we can also be kind of a positive voice towards politics that says, hey, we can do this and we really need to hurry up and don't put our goals to 2050 and 60. And that's really the big goal that we have as leaders for climate action. And when we looked at the market and thought, okay, what can we actually do? What will be our role? We noticed that there are actually a lot of consultancies out there, old consultancies that are in the market for a long time. And now there are more and more green tech companies coming. And uh, we like them, we work with them, but what we were really missing is a neutral organization that is not commercially driven. But that is basically simply, simply focusing on accelerating the speed of transformation. And that is why we decided to set up Leaders for Climate Action as a pure nonprofit organization with the three big goals. On the one hand side, to build an active community that comes from the business world and, and also facilitating the climate, climate actions that they can do. And the third one is to be um, kind of an accountability partner to really make sure that the changes are then also, also carried out. And now it's the big question, okay, how this looks and sounds very abstract. How, how do you actually do this? And the first thing that we, that, that, that we did, and that has been working amazingly, first of all in Germany, but now throughout 30 countries worldwide with probably 98% of all, of all companies being placed in Europe is to say, we need to start with the decision maker. So we need to start with the managing director, 
with a founder, maybe with a partner, and not only of the green companies, let's say Ecosia or some other great examples that are amazingly green companies, but we really need to focus also on the big digital companies and the medium-sized digital companies, and also on the venture capital companies if we really want to accelerate the speed of transformation. So that is basically what we do. We approach thousands and thousands of managing directors and we, we invite them to become part of our community and we tell them that they, they can get the help of us. We have tools, we know how to do the transformation and we will kind of be their neutral sparring partner that has nothing commercial in mind. And the only thing, or not the only thing, but we have something that we ask in return. And this ask is a pledge to directly start climate action now. And this pledge we call the Green Pledge. And the Green Pledge, it always begins with a personal pledge. So whenever someone joins our, our community, the first commitment and the first part of our tool that is kind of doing this is to measure your carbon footprint, reduce your carbon footprint, and also compensate your carbon footprint that you, you cannot reduce. And um, what we have learned is, if you really win the decision maker to also on a personal level to take action, all the transformation that happen afterwards in the organization, they are 10 times faster instead of not having the leading person on board. And that was one of the, the, the big things that we've learned. And that is something also that is not only taking place once, but they have to do it every year. And we will every year kind of return the data from the last year with a clear goal setting to reduce the carbon footprint, because that is, and I think everyone here knows it, uh, the most important thing that we, have to, that we have to do right now. The second step is the company pledge. So after the leader is done, there's one person in the organization who becomes a climate officer and sometimes even a whole team that becomes a climate officer. And here the job is to, within the first six months, and that is important for us, you need also to measure, reduce, and compensate your carbon footprint, and, and afterwards really focus on the, on the even bigger reduction potentials that can be taken. And we call this kind of our climate action pipeline, where we push people and where we get the agreement that they, that they will really change uh, something. And so far, we, we, we were able to really win at the biggest digital companies in Europe and most of, the, most of the important venture capital companies from Europe, who with about 50% yeah, have now fulfilled the Green Pledge. And um, therefore, uh, we noticed that there's really a voice that we are now representing um, that really asks for, for more action in the end. Yeah, this is just a few, a few numbers. Um, how much uh, carbon was reduced, how much uh, reduction there is slightly outdated. Um, and yeah, our companies employ about 150,000 uh, to 200,000 uh, people in Europe as of now. And uh, one thing that is very um, important for me is if you look at a purely digital company, this whole green pledge of measuring, reducing and compensating your carbon footprint, I like to call it to do the homework. And I, I don't think that it is something that you should be uh, overly proud and push it too much because it's really just the first step. And I think the, the, the most important thing is to really look at the big reduction potentials and also um, maybe carbon capture potentials that should be taken. And here we take the approach to say, after the normal onboarding, we bring our community together and think about what we can do that might have a much bigger impact than just the, the normal measure and reduction and compensation part. And therefore, I, I will just kind of show you the two and or three biggest projects that we have done in the field and maybe starting with the venture capital area. So when we onboard the first VC, we noticed, okay, if you just reduce your flights, if you just um, kind of make your office better. If you uh, also host your infrastructure for VC, it's basically just a website on a green um, provider. That's all good. But the big leverage is if you start influencing the companies that you invest in. If you start um, to get the portfolio companies that maybe employ hundreds of people into taking action. And the outcome of these thoughts was to say, we need to write a venture capital clause that is put into agreements that then forces all the investments to also measure, reduce, and compensate their carbon footprint after they signed the agreement. And 
after we had this idea and um, kind of wrote it down with um, a handful of VCs, we approached the biggest VCs in, in, in Germany and noticed that in the end now about 80% of all VCs in Germany, they, are, they have this in their agreement. So it's very likely as a startup or a digital startup, if you get money that you have to apply for it. And that is just something where we see um, our community, we can bring people together and we really try to kind of strengthen the thought to say, you should not compete on climate topics, but you should rather collaborate on climate topics. Another action that we did was our Climate Action Week that reached about 27 million people, where we basically built a website that enables people to get in contact with politicians about sustainability, that um, allows them to change their energy provider, to change a lot of things in their life. To, to become, um, yeah, to, to reduce their carbon footprint. And we reach the, we use the reach of our digital companies to really address all of these people. We, because we see this also as a very interesting kind of action point. Uh, if you look at, at how many people are listening to Spotify, how many people are watching Netflix to really use this reach in order to, to get them involved in taking climate action. But very important, this should not then distract you from looking at your own carbon footprint that is with these services right now also very, very massive. And it's a big job that uh, still needs to be done. And besides of that, we are looking into how can we really help green innovation happen in, in, in Europe? How can we use our network in order to make the most important green tech companies more successful? Or we are partnering up with organizations that are tackling the most important decarbonization efforts in our industry. And one example I would uh, like to name here, where we are also with uh, Microsoft, I think this one is missing now, but also with the Elia Group, with the, which is a big, big net provider in Belgium, Netherlands, and um, Germany. We are basically partnering up to enable green tracking. So for the first time, we are trying to connect the grid the energy producer, the data center, and the consumer all together. So for the first time, you can really understand, is the service that I use, use right now completely powered by uh, green energy, or is it maybe coming from a coal, coal power plant close to Berlin? And we think if we can bring transparency in this field, a lot of um, the providers of data centers and also um, other, other organizations they, they need to kind of then put more focus on, 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 on improving this. And also we, we see a lot of potential inside of the data centers to, to, um, yeah, to improve basically how, how it is functioning. And maybe the last um, sentence here, we are also um, part as a founding member of the, of the Green Software Foundation um, that is a part of Microsoft, where we basically try to also work on different frameworks on how you can code in a right way so we can directly reduce kind of the power that you need to run this code in order to reduce the carbon footprint. So if anything of this is interesting to the organization that you work for, or the department that you're working for, please don't hesitate to, to contact me and we can see how, you can, how we can get you involved there, there as well. And maybe now the, the last kind of mission that we see that we have as leaders for climate action is to support also the initiatives in, in the politics, no matter if it's on country level or um, on European level, and to really be the voice from the economy, from the big organizations, also from the future economy, which clearly is the digital economy as well, to say, yes, we can do this, and we encourage you to put in legislation that will basically speed up, um, up the changes. And this is, of course, on the one hand side, the Green New Deal, but also uh, we see uh, the carbon tax as something that will just help us to, to get, just get out the old um, technologies much faster than, than it would happen without a tax. So that is something that we, that we also, also push. We are never in a kind of lobby position, but we are always just like trying to make the point that the digital industry or a lot of companies in the digital industry say, we can do it, so please go ahead. Um, yeah, and I mean the, the, the last one, and I think with this I, I will also then call it an end and I look forward to, to your question, 
I think um, the main thing that we also learn in terms of motivating organizations and, and people in order to drive action is also you as an employer. And we notice that a lot of change that comes in the organizations comes from a group of people, a group of important employees in the organization saying, what is our strategy on the climate? What are we doing? If we don't have a clear setup, we will leave the organization. And that is a much more powerful kind of uh, weapon or ask that you have. And I, I can just encourage you to, to push this also at your workplace. With this, uh, I want to say thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much indeed, Philip. It's very, it was very interesting uh, indeed. And um, I, we have a number of questions already for you, so I'll take maybe a couple and uh, then um, uh, go back to the others uh, in the question and answer session. So there is a, uh, is a member of the audience who wants to know um, uh, how you can actually possibly distinguish serious commitment from simply following the market trend because the, the uh, the, the, the member of the audience thinks that uh, green pledges have actually become popular even in good business. So how do you distinguish um, the serious commitments from, from just those who follow the trend? Huh? Yeah, exactly. I think uh, one of the, we, we made it a bit easy for ourselves in the first step because we're mostly working with digital companies, mostly working with um, yeah, also medium-sized digital companies. And I've, if I look, for example, at the application where you can do meditation, right? Um, it's actually the green pledge that we force everyone to do. It actually represents a good amount of, of, of the carbon footprint. So we force and we track. So that is basically part of what we are also checking before we validate someone to, to be a, a verified member, is they need to include all emissions that come from their digital products and their ser servers, the hosting basically needs to be included, the energy needs to be included, the traveling needs to be included, the commuting needs to be included, everything office related needs to be included. And these are basically the things that are part of our pledge. And if you don't finish it, you will basically be kicked out or you will not be visible. And that is, I think, the, the, the first way how we make sure that the, the digital companies are applying to it. And then um, we have a second layer, and that is also something we are still improving, to be honest, where we want to have science-based targets as a, as a goal-setting measurement to really reduce the carbon footprint. And we are working right now on a model, on an easy way of science-based targets, because for small organizations, they cannot invest 60,000 euros for consultancy that prepares it. So we are working on a model to also really measure exactly the amount of, of reduction. Um, yeah, that is, that is the answer. Thanks very much indeed. Maybe another one. Uh, uh, do you have a um, methodology, do you plan to methodology to help companies to incentivize them to make use of AI for sustainability? Um, so the project that I just talked about, it has an AI element to it. So we are building like a prototype that includes an AI element uh, to make this um, possible. So there, yes, um, we have we have something that we are that we are testing or looking into on currently kind of the main focus of um, approaching companies and helping them to to become yeah become better. Uh, we don't have any AI element to it, but in case it makes sense, we are definitely. Uh, looking forward um, to do it. Uh, maybe also on a, on a side note, our team is still fairly small. So we are about 10 people working on this in full time. And we have all around the world about 50 people who support this in a voluntary way. So it is a bit limited by what we can focus on. Uh, but we would be very open to any kind of ideas in this regard. Thank you very much indeed, Phil. Right. Um, Let's then move on, and I would like to introduce the next speaker, um, who is uh, Sylvia Hiedmanns Stepien, um, the government, EU Government Affairs and Public Policy Manager at Google. Um, and uh, she works with uh, EU stakeholders and institutions, um, uh, and uh, with the aim to, to, to unleash the economic and social potential of um, internet uh, and the technologies that, that uh, Google develops. And um, um, 
she leads the public policy advo advocacy uh, uh, on artificial intelligence, uh, economic policy, including competition, as well as sustainability. Um, before her current uh, job, she worked at uh, the Lisbon Council, which is a Brussels-based uh, think tank. And uh, before that, she was also uh, working at the Ministry of the Economy uh, in Warsaw, where she was uh, in charge of EU economic affairs um, and also represented uh, Poland um, uh, in the uh, Council of the European Union. Um, she has a master's degree in political science and, and European politics and policies and graduated from KU Leuven and Warsaw University. So, uh, Silvia is going to speak about applying AI for climate change mitigation and adaptation, and I'll hand over then to Silvia. Silvia, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for this uh, very kind introduction and, and sharing uh, uh, my uh, biography. Um, so, it's a very kind of interesting session and, and um, I'm really looking forward to a uh, discussion also afterwards. Uh, as you have said, I'm, I'm Silvia. Um, I'm uh, working with Google in Brussels for eight years now, and, and these days I focus mostly on EU public policy work um, uh, with regards to artificial intelligence and sustainability. Next slide, please. Um, and today, in fact, I'm going to talk about the intersection of AI and sustainability. Um, uh, and I will maybe uh, start with a quick intro to AI and machine learning. I mean, you, you have spoke about it a bit, but just to kind of level set our discussion, then tell you a bit about um, how we approach sustainability, widely speaking, at Google. And then um, kind of merging both topics, I will deep dive a bit into how you can actually apply artificial intelligence for climate change mitigation and adaptation based on uh, experience that we have at Google. We can go to the next slide, please, uh, and the next slide as well. So starting a bit with kind of the really basics, um, uh, definitions when it comes to artificial intelligence. So largely speaking, you can, we can define AI as science of making things smart. You can go uh, click uh, once again. While machine learning is this kind of specific category of artificial intelligence that um, includes techniques that help to learn from data. We can go to the next slide. And of course, there are many uh, different machine learning uh, methods. Uh, but if you look at the kind of the general basic principle, uh, the question always is, given a certain input, what's the best output? Um, and the kind of the biggest advantage of machine learning is that it scales better than traditional uh, software and kind of um, uh, rules-based systems where you kind of have a certain code and you want to achieve a certain output. This is kind of more how the human brain uh, performs when it kind of looks at certain patterns and then recognizes them in a, uh, multiple helpful ways. We can go to the next slide, please. So why does Google care about machine learning? Of course, you know that um, uh, Google is now mostly speaking, largely speaking from kind of trying to connect people to the information they are looking for. And, and these days, the kind of the types of information um, that people are looking for uh, online are completely different than when the company started. Um, and, and today people search for question more than just terms. They are looking for across multiple information formats in different kind of, uh, formats, it's not only uh, words, it's also images, it's audio, it's video, and they are asking those questions in multiple languages. So, for instance, the kind of a query that you might have today, it's, uh, you know, where is a coffee shop with the best latte, and that is also kids-friendly, and you can ask that question in multiple languages. So, of course, there is no way, as Google, we could um, hand-code all those answers, so we need machine learning to understand those queries. And, of course, this is just one example of Google products, but Essentially, AI is used um, in all different products uh, that will develop these days. So just, just quickly uh, speaking, um, uh, what can machine learning do? Of course, it can help with mul multiple tasks from classification to prediction, uh, generation and language understanding. And many of those tasks, they are not kind of Google specific or, or tech, uh, um, you know, sector specific. They actually, a lot of them can be very much helpful to apply to solutions that we are looking for in terms of climate change. We can go to the next slide. But just to give you a kind of a quick understanding of what those different tasks are from, from Google's experience, when you look at classification, a perfect example here is how Google detects spam. So in the hand-coded old way, you would write a computer program um, that essentially, uh, you know, has explicit rules uh, to follow. So if your email contains a certain term, then it's a spam. 
But of course, this kind of approach has limitations because, you know, those new terms can constantly evolve and, and you know, uh, you will never be kind of successful with machine learning. However, you rather focus on writing a computer program that learns from examples to detect spam and it's far less rigid and much more adaptable. You can go to the next slide, please. Another example uh, that is quite uh, prominent uh, when it comes to also addressing um, uh, weather forecasting is something called prediction. And, and uh, if, uh, in terms of Google products, it's, uh, for instance, used uh, when it comes to Google Maps. So machine learning looks through examples for certain patterns and makes predictions on, on uh, new data. So it can definitely apply to traffic, uh, but it can also, as I said, apply to weather forecasting which is so relevant for climate change adaptation. We can go to the next slide, please. Um, what we call a generation, uh, it's, it's another uh, class of problems that machine learning uh, uh, can actually help us solve. So machine learning can essentially transform input into entirely new outputs. So for example, uh, it can generate text from a video to improve accessibility, but you know, even these days, uh, I have colleagues at Google and, and beyond working on generating musical melodies uh, with artificial intelligence. We can go to the next slide, please. But of course, as I said, machine learning is definitely far from unique to, to Google or tech sector more, more widely. What matters actually, and, and you had told us about so many different applications in so many different sectors, uh, that can be used uh, from, you know, healthcare for predictive analysis or diagnosis, agriculture for fraud detection, and of course, uh, what is important for the subject of our discussion today, um, to sustainability. And at Google, apart from using, uh, you know, AI uh, and machine learning centrally to each and every product that we develop, uh, we also out open source a lot of um, those technologies. Uh, and for instance, one of them is machine learning a library called TensorFlow. Uh, so essentially everyone can adapt those solutions and use those cutting edge technologies for the, any kind of sort of problems that uh, they are trying to uh, develop. And I will tell you a bit later one of the very interesting example uh, in the field of um, uh, sustainability. We can go to the next slide, please. Uh, now maybe a bit, a couple of words about how we approach sustainability. Uh, again, a couple of topics have been uh, mentioned already when it comes to kind of data centers, energy efficiency, uh, kind of devices. Um, but Google has been, you know, uh, uh, looking at sustainability as one of its core values since the founding. It means definitely purchasing carbon-free energy for our data centers, but also to offices that are around the world, and also building kind of some of the products that can help people make more sustainable decisions. And as well as, and that's probably kind of um, also something that I'm uh, quite used to uh, working vis-a-vis um, -vis the policymakers, uh, also advocating for those uh, policy solutions that can advance the technological solution that uh, a lot of players uh, are developing in this space. Just maybe in very concrete, uh, specific, measurable terms, um, Google has been carbon neutral already since 2007. So that's already 14 years of carbon neutrality, which I think is quite uh, quite a great uh, target. And since uh, 2017, every year since then, the company has matched 100% of electricity consumption of our global operations with renewable energy purchases. So this is a kind of a next step from trying to be carbon neutral, you're actually kind of trying to match your uh, electricity consumption with renewable energy purchases. Um, and of course, uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, uh, you probably know Google for, for something which is called the philosophy of moonshots. Uh, a lot of engineers uh, in Silicon Valley, they are kind of really trying to uh, um, uh, develop solutions for things that might seem crazy or a bit impossible, like self-driving cars or flying, uh, you know, balloons to bring connectivity to remote areas. And this philosophy, uh, you know, with the understanding that climate change is really something that everybody has to try to unite their forces and find the immediate solution. So we are now applying this to, to sustainability. And last year, uh, Google CEO um, Sundar Pichai uh, announced that Google as the first major company, we are going to shift from a net zero model. Of course, this is also kind of really important uh, kind of carbon uh, 
net zero approach, um, but that model kind of focuses mostly on emitting and compensating for those emissions. Uh, but the next stage that you can think about in terms of moonshot, it's actually kind of trying to go um, around for absolute zero. So you simply never emit carbon from your operations in the first place. And specifically, the target that the company has set is to by 2030 to fully decarbonize our electric electricity supply uh, and operate on clean energy every hour of every day. So normally speaking, you know, with renewable purchases um, uh, that the company has reached, I mean, that's already kind of a quite, quite an achievement. But of course, in different locations uh, uh, around the world, you have different kind of supply uh, um, of that clean energy. Um, so now the kind of approach is to really have that every hour, every day, everywhere, uh, to make sure that uh, you never actually use that energy that would be um, not decarbonized. We can go to the next slide, please. Um, but of, of course, this is like a, a, you know, a great target. It seems, seems all nice and, um, and, and kind of you know, <laughs> uh, ambitious, but uh, let me tell you a bit about how we are going to achieve that. Um, so largely speaking, we are going to approach that by working on three pillars and uh, artificial intelligence plays a role across all of them. So first of all, we want to accelerate um, you know, a carbon-free future through our own operations. So kind of making sure that as a digital technology and something that Philip spoke about, you, are, you really have you know, a track record of operating uh, your own offices, your own data centers in a carbon-free uh, way. Um, um, and I, I told you about that target, but of course we are also quite involved in sustainability bonds uh, and also kind of trying to scale those solutions uh, elsewhere. Um, you can click once again. Um, then, of course, a, a second pillar is focusing on scaling that work uh, that we are uh, applying uh, at the company uh, via technology and partnerships. So we are working um, with many cities across the world to kind of help them uh, reduce their emissions. We are also centrally, what is kind of uh, important for today's discussion, applying uh, AI and machine learning to, um, to help improve energy efficiency. Uh, and all different sort of facilities. And we are also kind of fostering those sort of partnerships and, and with all different actors in the ecosystem through our um, kind of more philanthropic google.org um, arm of the company. Uh, lastly, uh, of course, you know, Google is a, a largely speaking a consumer facing company. We offer a lot of uh, products to, to uh, consumers uh, from search to maps to translation to all those things that, um, that you might be aware of. Uh, but we also want to, uh, you know, create a change from those products and um, allow people to live more sustainability by 2022. And this is, for instance, uh, by suggesting in Google Maps more sustainable uh, routes, uh, options, or kind of integrating the bike sharing opportunities, all those kind of small things that actually can help us, each and every one of us, to kind of be a bit more aware of the, of the solutions that we um, uh, choose and what's their impact. We can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so now I would like to a bit combine those topics. So knowing what AI is and what it can do in terms of classification, prediction, generation, and a bit knowing how the company has been looking at sustainability, um, I would like to, uh, to tell you a bit more about what specifically AI can do in the field uh, there. Um, uh, and I would say that AI can definitely help with uh, mitigation, so reducing the emissions and better use of the existing resources. Uh, secondly, can help um, adapt to the change. And, and large, uh, the last point would be around kind of uh, thinking about uh, long-term research and all those kind of uh, really exciting uh, and, and you know, uh, promising uh, research solutions in terms of, for instance, uh, um, uh, batteries or hardware or kind of uh, carbon capture uh, and storage. Uh, but let's start with mitigation. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. One example that I wanted uh, to call out, and it, this is the one that combines Google's own operations and kind of how the learnings that we had in our data centers, how we are now trying to scale them uh, uh, through uh, working with our per uh, partners. So as you can imagine, uh, uh, Google data centers are uh, quite, you know, uh, well optimized. Uh, 
but a couple of years ago, uh, there was a, a, you know, a group of engineers that wanted to see whether with uh, machine learning models, whether we can actually uh, still pro, uh, you know, uh, have some efficiency gains in terms of how energy and how cooling is being deployed uh, through those data centers. And actually we discovered that through machine learning model, some parameters can be additionally optimized to reduce the cooling even more. So on, on this kind of nice graph, you can see um, here that the energy use um, uh, on the low end uh, um, you know, at the beginning was there, uh, but then you uh, kind of turn on the machine learning model um, and the energy usage actually goes down. And altogether, using machine learning, uh, you would be surprised to hear that the increase in energy efficiency of Google's data centers it was as uh, large as 30%. So 30% of energy efficiency increase uh, thanks to machine learning models, which is kind of quite huge. Um, uh, after that discovery, of course, we are kind of applying that uh, across the board in Google's own data centers. But we are also making those solutions available to, you know, not only to other data centers of other companies, but also to commercial buildings. If you look at kind of large scale buildings that require that sort of energy, you can think about airports or industrial spaces. So this is, uh, you know, another kind of uh, exciting application where you can scale those solutions that you develop on your own. We can go to the next slide. Uh, a tool here, uh, here uh, we can return one slide. Yes, thank you. Um, so a tool here that I wanted to tell you a bit more about, it's called uh, Environmental Insights Explorer. And, and Yuha was telling a bit more about how data and kind of uh, um, can help us, uh, you know, also uh, apply some of the solutions in terms of climate change. So this specific tool can be used, for instance, for measuring the solar rooftop potential. So um, the data there is largely coming from Google Maps. Uh, and, and it kind of helps to understand the angles of different homes and also the angles that the sun will typically fall on a, on a certain uh, latitude and longitude. Um, and, and essentially it allows an individual to make a more climate friendly choices to kind of understand if their rooftop has a you know, solar potential and what that could be. But the tool is also uh, uh, more and more used for different uh, sort of applications and uh, the team who is developing it and kind of deploying it um, also told me a bit uh, more about some of the air quality management projects that they are now pursuing with different cities. You can go to the next slide, please. Here is another example uh, that was released on Android. Android, Android is uh, Google's operating uh, open source uh, system. Um, and the solution here is about optimizing mobile battery use. It's a technique developed uh, by using machine learning uh, and it's called adaptive battery. Um, and of course, you know, devices uh, use uh, some energy and uh, we have a lot of applications these days and some of them, we use them quite actively, but others are, you know, probably, you know, we use them less frequently, but they are sometimes running, even if we are not actually using them. So with this adaptive battery model, machine learning uh, model operates directly on your phone and it actually identifies which apps are being used actively and which not. And in the case of the ones that are not actively used, the machine learning helps to minimize, for instance, the resolution, which in turn kind of leads to much more optimized uh, mobile battery use and, and kind of much uh, energy use eventually for that uh, device to run. We can go to the next slide, please. Um, yes, I was telling you about this open source machine learning um, library called TensorFlow, which essentially anyone can take from the internet and uh, build on the top of it. Um, so this is in a kind of a really interesting project in Brazil. Um, uh, and when it comes to also kind of illegal deforestation, uh, a team using machine learning, they build very simple devices that they placed eventually on, on uh, uh, on trees to listen to chainsaws uh, in the rainforest. Um, and essentially, so the machine learning model would take the input of a sound um, and it would learn from kind of recognizing that sound that the output there is the chainsaw. Um, and when that would happen, uh, it would send an alert to the team that normally before that tool, they would be kind of uh, you know, driving around or kind of moving around a forest to kind of spot where they are hearing certain sounds of illegal deforestation. But with this device, they were actually able to place it on a tree and then get an alert and then only intervene. So much more efficient, much more uh, scalable solution. Um, 
and it kind of is being uh, used to help uh, enforce uh, the kind of the, the solutions when it comes to illegal deforestation. So that's that's really powerful example. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. Another project that uh, we also um, uh, came across uh, was related to this um, uh, Google.org. I told you about this philanthropic arm of the company where we are trying to foster different projects, provide some support um, when it comes to technology, but also when it comes to uh, funding. And uh, two years ago, we ran a challenge focused specifically on, on, uh, on this intersection or artificial intelligence and climate change. And we selected out of 3,000 different projects, uh, 20 projects, and one of them uh, was called uh, What Time. Uh, they were one of the winners. Uh, and essentially, their proposal was to um, was a carbon tracker uh, to use image processing and satellite networks to estimate uh, emissions from uh, fossil fuel power plants. So they were trying to provide a bit more more quantifiable way of, of measuring those emissions. Um, and, and kind of making that uh, accessible to everyone through open source. Um, but what is also kind of interesting that uh, the project has led after that to kind of a consortium of nonprofits, and they are called uh, Climate Trace, that are using AI not only kind of when it comes to uh, fossil fuel power plants, but they are kind of uh, largely trying to measure greenhouse gas emissions uh, remotely uh, to scale those solutions. We can go to the next slide, please. And something maybe kind of that each of us experiences by working from home and kind of, you know, using more and more digital technologies uh, that, of course, uh, you know, uh, those technologies consume more energy. But equally, when you kind of calculate that against the travel that it uh, helps to reduce, uh, I mean, that's another kind of question, whether machine learning and kind of the changes of our patterns of behavior uh, can help us to actually reduce uh, travel over a long time. And here... Uh, there is a picture of um, something which is called Project Starline that was announced at Google's uh, annual I.O. Developers Conference, uh, I think, just two months ago. It's, it's an example of how AI can help advance this kind of more real-time 3D sensing um, uh, experience when you are video conferencing. And I think, of course, again, technology uh, uses some energy, but when you kind of uh, calculate that against that reduction of a travel, I think that could be one of the solutions that we can also apply there. We can move to the next slide, please. Okay, so that was about mitigation uh, and kind of reduction. Uh, the next area that I wanted to speak about is around adaptation. Um, and of course, machine learning uh, there, it's, it's, I would say the kind of the biggest potential um, uh, it's around weather forecasting and how you can use that predictive, uh, we can go to the next slide, predictive capacity of machine learning that I told you about, um, for instance, in the field of uh, flooding or earthquakes of, or wildfires, all those phenomena that we are kind of globally experiencing more and more and that are, of course, related to climate change. So, uh, of course, floods are, are, are bad. Now they, they are kind of, they lead to $9.8 of annual a billion dollars of annual damage and they affect really, uh, um, uh, really a lot of people and of course they will get uh, worse at higher temperatures. We can go to the next slide. And, and some of my colleagues at Google, they have been kind of trying to develop uh, AI solutions to help to improve flood forecasting. So of course you know that those floods might be coming, but how you can kind of minimize the impact uh, on, on on individuals, but having a better, a better understanding with machine learning on when and where is that going to happen. We can go to the next slide, please. Uh, another example, very kind of similar logic of, of prediction, using machine learning for prediction, is how AI can help to improve wildfire responses. This is a huge thing that is affecting, I mean, different places in the world, but very kind of prominent when it comes to California and when at the headquarters of the company are, and you can apply machine learning through early, early detection, uh, kind of tracking the fire state, but also kind of importantly trying to predict that fire from spreading. We can go to the next slide, please. Uh, similarly, um, another kind of uh, phenomenon that is happening is uh, that AI can be used for predicting earthquake aftershocks. Uh, so you can see here uh, in that kind of moving panel that the, the blue dots is the main earthquake location and all of the points in red around are aftershocks and these also kind of cre create a lot of damage. 
Um, so uh, some of my colleagues, they partner with the Harvard University to kind of try to see how machine learning can be applied to, to uh, prevent those aftershocks from happening because the current physics models, uh, it's pretty much impossible to, to, uh, to predict where those shocks would be happening. And they had really kind of some uh, very promising results there and they are, they are kind of trying to apply that from research to, um, to kind of finding solutions. But I think that's also one of the areas where we can try to adapt to the changes that are happening by using technology. You can go to the next slide, please. So of course, uh, I mean, in the kind of uh, policy discussion, there is a lot of focus on uh, making AI and machine learning responsible, ethical, uh, human-centric and trustworthy. I'm involved in this discussion, working with the colleagues, of course, at the commission and wider community on making sure that, uh, you know, AI is, for instance, not biased. And I think that's an important um, field of work. We can go to the next slide here. We can go to the next, yeah, thank you. But uh, I think the kind of maybe less so, uh, less discussed and, and uh, equally important part of the discussion about artificial intelligence and is how AI can help, uh, help all of us to make more sustainable decisions. And of course, you know, coming from uh, technology companies, I'm probably over optimistic about the, the solutions and you have to also think about what's the impact of those solutions and, and how you can mitigate there. And, you know, uh, fighting climate change, definitely AI is not going, going to solve everything. Uh, um, but I think we have to kind of collectively try to explore the policy change, the collective action that Philippe was speaking about, but also many of those promising uh, technological solutions that can help adapt to kind of collective action here. We can go to the next slide here. And I will stop here. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Sylvia. A very comprehensive uh, view of what uh, you are doing in this area at uh, at Google. Um, let me just maybe ask you a couple of questions, uh, um, as I I did with Philip. Um, two very different uh, uh, takes, if you like, two very different uh, from different um, opposite ends of the spectrum. But first, uh, quite a technical question. Um, uh, how do you see the future of predictive modeling um, simulation? Will, quote, real AI, unquote, not just machine learning, replace one day the need for modeling? Uh, yes, I will try to respond to that. Um, I think when it comes to, you know, all those solutions that artificial intelligence have, they are all, all kind of very promising and we see them being deployed in all different applications, et cetera. But, but if I understand the question correctly, it's more about kind of this general artificial intelligence idea. What I'm, I'm not an engineer or machine learning, uh, uh, you know, scientist myself, but I understand from, from my colleagues in the field that we are still quite far from that idea that, you know, artificial intelligence can, um, can perform the tasks that are kind of, you know, um, that we know that are, uh, you know, much more human driven. And I think the, the biggest advantage there is to combine some of those predictive classification generation capabilities of the technology and combine them with, you know, human core values, our kind of perception and understanding uh, uh, to deliver the best kind of results. I'm not sure I'm responding to the question, but that's how I understood it. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure either. I suspect it might have to do with the sort of dichotomy or the, the um, um, two different types of artificial intelligence, symbolic artificial intelligence on the one hand, as it used to be sometimes referred to as the, the, the good old AI, and, and as opposed to machine learning, deep learning based AI. But of course, for Google, uh, the focus is obviously on the machine learning, deep learning side of things. I don't, uh, I don't know to what extent, if at all, you are engaged in, in symbolic AI. Uh, I would say so that the kind of indeed machine learning, deep learning, this is the kind of this subset of artificial intelligence when kind of based on neural nets. And this is where the company is largely kind of developing the majority of, of its efforts. But I wouldn't uh, preclude that, you know, some, some of the teams at Google, it's, it's kind of quite a big company. Uh, is also focusing there, but I'm happy to kind of take that question and come back to the to you uh, at the later stage. Okay, thank you. Then the other question um, is is very different. Um, uh, do you think Google could be interested in using AI uh, to dissuade consumers from searching, emailing, watching videos for sustainability reasons? Uh, 
<laughs> That's a very good question. And I would maybe pro probably answer to that question differently. So from, from by optimizing and using machine learning, um, you know, techniques and trying to understand what actually is the kind of the intention of a consumer when they come to search for a certain information and making that uh, more efficient, we are actually reducing that energy use. Because if you would be, you know, trying, if you would be looking, for instance, for directions um, uh, and you would kind of be hoping as an individual that you will get a certain map, but we would be showing you a video of a, of a place or just like a website with 10 blue links that you would have to click and click again. I think that eventually that would be kind of an uh, experience that would lead to kind of staying longer on a, a given service and kind of consuming through that more energy. But applying machine learning to optimize those solutions and trying to give much better, much faster decisions I think that eventually helps to kind of free people up from, you know, staying in front of the computer and just getting the information and, and doing whatever they want uh, with it. Um, that would be my kind of a large answer there. So trying to ma make uh, you know, much faster, much impactful, much relevant uh, recommendations to an individual. So they are not kind of dragged into searching and watching and, 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 and scrolling online all the time. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Sylvia. So I propose that we now move on to our third speaker, um, um, Alberto Arribas uh, Herranz, um, who is Microsoft Sustainability Science Lead for Europe. Um, he's also a visiting professor at the University of Reading um, at, in its uh, uh, Atmospheric Science Department, and he has a PhD in Climate Modeling and a Diploma in Strategy and Innovation uh, from the University of Oxford. Uh, before uh, his uh, career in uh, Microsoft, uh, Alberto worked at the UK Met Office, uh, where he led a research and development for near-term uh, climate prediction and founded the Informatics Lab, um, an innovation department where he led uh, research projects um, with top teams in the technology industry. His research has been published in over 50 papers and received various awards. Uh, he's a member of the European Environment Agency Scientific Committee and member of the UK Natural Environment Research Council Digital Environment Steering Committee. He's also an expert reviewer for the UK Parliament Office for Science and Technology uh, and an expert reviewer for the Commission, European Commission in the area of future and emerging technologies. Um, Alberto is going to talk us about AI for Earth. So without further ado, I hand over to, to you, Alberto, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Johan. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here today, and I have, I have greatly enjoyed the presentation from, from Philippe and, and Sylvia. So very much looking forward, actually, to interact with everybody on, on this topic. And I, I should say, I have, I have a cold, so you may, you may see me coughing or, or sneezing during the presentation. Hopefully, you will not hear me, but I'm, I'm assured that it is not contagious via YouTube, so, so we, are all, we are all safe on that, on that front. So yeah, I want to talk a little bit more about what we are doing in Microsoft on this particular area of AI for Earth. And I, I wanted to start, let me see if I can move the slides. Yeah, I wanted to start actually by talking a little bit about the, the Net Zero Challenge, because I'm sure that you have all heard that we are just trying to essentially go into, into Net Zero by 2050. And this is a, a really challenging problem. So we have given ourselves the... <laughs> the challenge to to remain into apologies about about that <clears throat> so we have given ourselves the challenge to try to keep the the temperatures actually going no higher than 1.5 degrees and, and to give ourselves a, a good probability of doing this, a probability of 66%. And I wanted to, to say this because it's a, it's a huge challenge and I wanted to, to put it in the context of the, of the graph that appears here on the, on the right hand side in which essentially we just have a very short period in the, kind of in the, in the context of, of human life to do this. So we want to go from emissions that are kind of around 40 gigaton now to pretty much zero by, by 2050. And, and this is challenging for many reasons, but it's also important to remember that we are doing this 
not just because we want to save planet Earth. So we want to save planet Earth so planet Earth can essentially maintain life on it. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about, about that. So in the next slide, I wanted to highlight that this is not just a, a challenge from, from the point of view of just limiting the temperature increase, but it's a challenge actually in terms of the keeping a planet that can maintain ecosystems and, and can maintain not only kind of the, the whole kind of set of species and, and it has been kind of now estimated that we have more than, than a million kind of species at, at risk at the moment, but also kind of the human population. So there is there is no point of essentially just trying to save the planet if the planet is not going to be able to maintain life. So these two things are are very strongly interconnected. And and this has been highlighted now in a in a number of reports. And I've mentioned in here the the recent review produced by Professor Dasgupta, just commissioned by the, the UK government, in which it expressed all of this in a in an extremely nice and, and compelling way. So I, I want to highlight and I want everybody to remember that the two things come together and, and biodiversity, the protection of ecosystems and climate change are essentially aspects of, of the same problem. And we really need to consider them together when we are we are looking into this. And of course, and it has been highlighted by, by Juha and it has been mentioned by, by some of the other speakers. So we have we have the opportunity and it's a huge opportunity and a, and a huge asset that we have with technology and with AI to solve these these challenges that, that climate change and biodiversity is, is throwing in our direction. But we also have this this challenge actually of making all of the, the technology industry fully green and and we have a big fo footprint. So so you have, have have talked about that and this slide just gives you an idea on, on kind of the the size of the cloud that Microsoft runs in, in Azure. So it has more than a, a hundred data centers and, and is in present in more than hundred and forty countries. And we are essentially putting all of our data centers using clean energy and, and this is kind of a, an aspect of, of the whole issue and, and a lot of work is going there and, and optimizing them but it has more dimensions as well in terms of the, the waste that is produced, the water that is consumed and it is within this context that Microsoft kind of uh, express all of all of our environmental sustainability commitments and and these are very challenging commitments that we have given to ourselves and, and I want to kind of talk briefly about them before going into some of the specifics of how you can use technology not just to to help ourselves actually but to help others and I I want to emphasize that so our our environmental sustainability commitments are commitments that we do ourselves and that we we are going to achieve ourselves but we are doing them as a way of actually learning and developing products and services and knowledge that we are very happy to share with others and, and to kind of facilitate that others can take so the whole kind of uh, the planet and, and the whole kind of collection of of organizations and governments and non-profits can, can go into this into this journey so I, I like to say that sustainability is most definitely a, a team sport so there is no point of Microsoft achieving its, its sustainability commitments if we cannot help others to achieve their sustainability commitments but essentially what we are trying to do is to be carbon negative by 2030 so this is not only kind of avoid any emissions but we also want to be able to capture the emissions that we have emitted historically since the company was was created in 1975 and, and Therefore, we are also kind of investing a lot, not only kind of in optimization and use of renewable energies and so on, but also in, in carbon capture. And I will mention this a little bit later on in some of the examples. Water positive. So there are quite a lot of regions in the world that are kind of water stress and a lot of people that are living in regions that, that are water stress. So we really want our data centers and our, our organization to be water positive and, and be a part of the solution, not part of the problem in these, in these regions. Zero waste. We are very committed to, to really empower the circular economy and that goes at all levels from our products, whether it is kind of a surface tablet to our big data centers and, and doing research on things like kind of cement and so on. And how can you make all of these kind of materials more, more sustainable? And finally, and this is, this is where I'm going to be spending most of my, my talk, 
to build the planetary computer. And, and, and this is where the whole kind of AI for Earth, the planetary computer, if you want, is a component of our AI for Earth uh, program. And it's a way of really empowering others to be able to use all of these technologies in the area of, of sustainability. So I really want to highlight this, and, and this is very important to us. So, so our, our CEO keeps repeating us that we are not here to be cool. We are here to make others cool. So this, this double helix of really minimizing our environmental footprint at the same time that we maximize the, the help that we provide to others to, to have a positive impact of, of our services and partnerships is really the thing that is, is driving us. And it's also a big opportunity because now we can do things that they, they were really difficult to do only a few years ago. So we have a lot of data and sometimes people will, will claim that having a lot of data may also be a problem. But whereas that's true, we have now the opportunity to really observe things that we couldn't observe before and therefore be having a, a better option actually of addressing the problem, particularly because now this data is coupled to a, to a big compute and also there are big markets for this. So this is not something that is happening only in the IT industry or in the transport industry or in oil and gas. This is something that is happening in every single industry and every single kind of economic uh, aspect of, of our lives. And, and therefore, it's a big opportunity also for everybody to be able to be part of the solution. Very quickly, our AI for Earth and the Planetary Computer Program is something that we do with others. And we have run over 600 projects now in, in more than 90 countries. And it has really three aims. So the first aim is to increase the access to cloud and, and AI technologies. And we provide a series of grants for, for this. And it's not only the grants that we give for the AI for Earth, so we also have programs like the Climate Innovation Fund, which acts almost as a, as a venture capital to facilitate new research and new and new kind of technology development in the area of carbon capture. We also want to build not only tools and the planetary computer, but a community around them. And this is, again, very, very important. So it's not just a question of having the tools. You really need to have communities that can use them and can work together to solve these problems. Because it's it only by doing that, by having these layers of the tools and having the community, that you can really fuel innovation and really facilitate and accelerate these kind of uh, research and, and the application and the opera operationalization of all of these solutions in all of these different areas of the of the problem. Oops. So in, in terms of the specifics, I think it's worth actually spelling this, this out a little bit because these steps that I mentioned in this slide in terms of the data, the compute, the algorithms, the, the deployment of, of APIs, the hosting of applications. I think it's, it's fair to say that these steps are still not as easy as everybody would like them to be. So if you want to use environmental data, for example, whether it is weather or clim and climate data or biodiversity data, it's not easy. So quite often you really need a PhD in this subject to be able to understand the complexities of the data, the nuance of the data, the formats that they are, the same is true in terms of then being able to create an algorithm that is going to distribute and scale. So we, we really work to make each one of these steps easier. And as I say, build the communities that can help themselves and, and create things and, and have more things that are built on top of these kind of, uh, if you want, individual building blocks that we are providing for, for the whole of the, the world to, to be able to build this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you three specific examples in in this space and the first one is a project called premonition and if you want this is an example of us working with scientists to be able to to improve research this project is quite interested and it started as, a, as an effort to use artificial intelligence to facilitate the tracking of, of infectious diseases and, and then it has been applied as part of our ai for earth uh, area to to essentially deal with biodiversity and this this diagram what it shows is if you think about it what mosquitoes are doing is taking blood samples of a lower large set of, of animals so the the realization here or the insight was okay if we were able to analyze the dna of this blood that the mosquitoes are taking we would be able to have insights in terms of the population and the and the health of the ecosystem that we are that we are looking at 
And this is what happened. So essentially, we have drones and there is quite a lot of research in terms of tracking all of these mosquitoes. And then there are some robotic traps that can identify the right type of mosquito that, that essentially is going to take blood samples from a particular animal. And these robotic traps are able to capture the right mosquito and then that insect is sent to the laboratory where the blood is sampled, the DNA is sequenced, and this is done using the, the cloud or Azure technologies. And these essentially have meant that what before was taking around 30 days to be able to do the analysis can be completed in, in a few hours. And this is where the insight comes out. So suddenly the researchers now can start creating heat maps, can start understanding the health of the ecosystem, the health of the population in that particular area and, and this becomes critical particularly when you have areas that are under pressure as we are seeing with climate change being able to have this real-time monitoring is the thing that enables you to be able to take action in in a rapid fashion this this project has been great and, and i mentioned it here on the right hand side the, the kind of the level of accuracy and that's important from a scientific point of view but i also want to highlight on the left hand side that Actually, in terms of the complexity of what it does, that is really kind of comparing all of the DNA that is being checked against all of the known organisms. It happens really quickly, in, in barely three hours you do it, and it's not a huge amount of, of resources that you use. And this is again, thanks to machine learning that you can do this. Only with, with 200 nodes, three hours, you have compared a DNA sample against everything that we know of, of all of the known organisms. And this is quite, quite a marvelous kind of example of the things that you can do today. The next one that I wanted to show is it's another project called iNaturalist. And this is a project that was done together with the California Academy of Science and National Geographic. And, and this is a project that shows how you can work with the general public. And again, you have a little bit of a flow of the project in this slide here. What this project is, is doing in a nutshell is enabling people to take pictures with, with, a, with essentially a smartphone of animals, plants, fungi. And these pictures are then uploaded to the cloud where kind of machine learning vision are able to identify. And there is a, a twist here. It's not just that the machine learning is helping the identification of, of the particular animal that you see in the picture, but it's also uh, facilitating the interaction between the kind of experts in the field with the general public to be able to confirm the kind of the species that you have found and to be able to provide further feedback. And this positive loop actually between science and the general public and the use of machine learning, so you are also kind of having a, an improved system in which you can annotate the image and improve the, the system itself. is amazing because what this really is enabling is again, having this, this if you want, entwinement of, of the general public with the scientists to solve particular problems. And this is really allowing conservationists actually to protect kind of species that are at, at risk much, much faster. And some of the data from these, these platforms, so they are near kind of 3 million registered users. There have been over 40 million of observations. And it's not just that quite a lot of the species, I, I mentioned there are over 200,000 species have been observed. But some really interesting things, like kind of a species being rediscovered so and, and being told that a, a particular snail in, in Vietnam had been observed that apparently had not been recorded since Captain Cook had, had been around those areas, or, or a particular kind of rattlesnake that has been identified in, in Texas, again, that had not been seen for many, many years. And these are illustrations of the power of essentially the cloud together with machine learning to really scale things and, and do things fast and at a scale that otherwise would be impossible. The final example I wanted to, to mention here is Silvia Terra, which is an example of working with the startups and also it has a twist. It's, a, it's an example that illustrates how you can measure kind of the carbon and, and particularly how you can start using this to do carbon sequestration, which is one of the critical elements actually you want to be able to, to deal with climate change. So climate change, one of the big problems is measuring the, the amount of kind of carbon emissions and particularly on, on land and soil use and agriculture, that's the most difficult thing, much more difficult than measuring kind of the emissions from, from fossil fuels. So this, this example and this particular project goes in that direction. What Silvia Terra did, which is a relatively small startup, 
was to reimagine how you could do forest inventory. So it started with the, with the idea that you could take satellite images and you could process them very rapidly in, in the cloud using machine learning to identify particular kind of elements like, like particular trees. And, and essentially what happens is you can, you can use Azure and, and particular uh, high resolution machine learning to identify all of these all of these elements and then that can go into the, the conservationists, it can go into the government officials, it can go into the landowners themselves. And having all of this information that is being shared across all of the players really allowed you to have a more holistic treatment of the of the forest. These are just one of the one of the numbers of the amount of land that is being covered, the amount of trees that are being observed. So you can see over 92 billion individual trees that are being documented. But I was going to play a small video just to give you a, an illustration of what that mean from the point of view of the, the user. And, and this is just looking at a particular forest, the, the Olympic National Forest, which through this data, you can essentially go in and, and start looking at individual conifers and start looking at the the impact of these these individual trees and individual areas actually on, on the habitat risk and, and the likelihood of having problems or or not in in particular areas of the forest and and there is generality the fact that this is now happening at resolutions of around 200 meters really changes the the game and as i say this has now been used and, and we are working with them very closely on on the whole area of carbon sequestration how can you change the forestry practices to ensure that forests are capturing more carbon and really helping everybody to be able to to monitor how much carbon is, is happening and also understand which forestry practices are really going to increase this and have a kind of a long term and as i say measuring this has been one of the most challenging areas when, when you deal with with climate change Oop, let me see if i can go to the next slide yeah so this essentially take me to the to the end of the presentation and i i wanted to highlight a few a few things so this is a great opportunity. So we really have now technologies and we have data that we have never had before. And, and the problem that we are tackling is a huge problem, but definitely the, the use of AI is going to be one of the instrumental things to be able to, to be successful on this. We are definitely working and putting a lot of effort in making IT green and these two dimensions, making our own industry green and sustainable, really comes together and with the use of, of artificial intelligence and cloud as, as enablers. And I would really like to highlight this, this final point of sustainability really is a team sport and the creation of public-private partnerships from research to operation is going to be the critical element here. And, and I, I'm I'm really keen on this and this this is part of my, my role, for example, working with the European Environment Agency to really make sure that we can create these public-private partnerships and accelerate this development for, for everybody and, and that's really kind of core to our mission in, in Microsoft. And that's everything. I will stop here and I will be very happy to take questions from from members of the audience and, and to discuss the whole issue with my, my fellow panel members. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Alberto. Very interesting again. Um, um, a lot going on, I can see. Uh, much, much more than I would have thought, to be honest. Um, um, there is one question immediately to that I would like to answer from the audience. Um, um, this uh, Silvia Terra, um, uh, could it also be applied to measure C carbon sequestration? Yeah, yeah, and that's that's one of the projects that we are doing with them now. So Microsoft, one of the things that we have done recently, actually, we have completed the biggest kind of corporate purchase in history of of carbon emissions. So we we bought over a, a million metric tons of of CO two, and using using removal solutions. And and Silvia Terra was one of the one of the groups that we work with and part of the project was actually just improving all of these kind of measurements of how carbon is sequestered by by forestry and i think it's a critical issue so as i say the whole 
carbon emissions and carbon sequestration in soils and land is, is one of the areas where we have the biggest error bars. So we are very keen actually to be able to improve that using machine learning and, and cloud technologies. Okay, thanks very much. Another question then to you. Um, so do you think that these machine learning applications uh, could help improve biosphere modeling in climate modeling? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely very positive on that particular point, and it, it links with the previous question that was being asked about modeling. So, in many ways, I, I don't want machine learning to tell me the things that I already know. So, we know the laws of physics. I don't want to use machine learning to rediscover those laws of physics, but there are a lot of things that we don't know. And, and we have now the luxury of essentially moving into it people call kind of physics based or, or, or physics driven machine learning in which you can bring some of the knowledge that you have with the power of learning from data to really improve your modeling and, and the biosphere particularly is one of the elements where I think this could be most productive. Okay, thanks very much. Um, um, uh, another one while you're at it. Um, on the example of forest monitoring, for example, uh, where do you get the satellite data? Does it come from uh, um, systems like Copernicus? Or where do you get the imagery from? Yeah, so it, I don't remember specifically which which particular satellite the, the data from Silvia Terra was coming from, but but essentially, yeah, it's from systems like like Copernicus and and we are great believers actually on on being able to create, if you want, an ecosystem. So we are going to have big programs like Copernicus that are really going to be improving the, the way that we are able to measure and understand the ecosystems. And then we are going to be able to use kind of new technologies like machine learning to exploit this data and to be able to, to do things like uh, calibrating and correcting the satellite data. This is something that quite often is, is forgotten that putting a satellite up there is, is very expensive. And then you have to be kind of correcting and calibrating the data all the time. And, we are very keen to work in all of these aspects. How do you improve the satellite data? How do you make it easier and, and kind of relevant to particular communities, whether it is that they need to detect a, a tree or they need to detect an area that could be, that could be flooded? Mm -hmm. Great, thanks very much. So thank you to all the speakers. Um, there are a number of questions in store. <laughs> So um, this is now basically the, uh, let's say, the question and answer session officially opening, though, of course, I already asked you questions earlier on uh, directly related to your presentations. Um, but um, there are a number of also questions that um, are clearly uh, identifiable as having been uh, having been addressed to one or, uh, or uh, the other of the speakers. So I would like to go back to Philip. Um, um, since um, now it's a while since you talked, but this question already arrived uh, uh, towards the end of your presentation. So when you approach uh, decision makers, uh, Philip, uh, what is the general response? Are they all really ready to get on board? Uh, uh, do they do they uh, get enthusiastic about it, or is there reluctance there? How do what is the, the reaction um, that you typically get from from uh, the people you approach? Yeah, so I, I think um, there are diff I would classify the different leaders in different segments. And, and I think uh, the, the, the great thing, especially of like startups or, or medium sized companies that we work with a lot, is that the mindset um, is already there that this topic is a very important topic. And especially in Europe, no one is denying that we need to solve this problem. So in general, they are very open and there's a lar large motivational point that comes from an intrinsic motivation point. So they want to do something. And the data actually shows that um, the problem is the gap between awareness and action. So you see 80% of all founders in Europe want to do something that is positive for the climate and change their, their business towards it, and only 25 do it. And therefore, we see um, yeah, a positive feedback of saying, okay, finally, now someone is proactively approaching me and telling me what, what the first steps are. So that is, let's say, the most positive um, point. Um, where it gets actually a bit critical is whenever you focus on the business model. When you say you need uh, to, to change uh, the business model, and, and here um, there is a small percentage of people who simply say, I cannot do this right now. 
I, I, I will destroy my business, I cannot do it. But um, we notice like whenever you start working on the problem, and that is why we also deployed a green pledge that is easy enough to directly say, I want to do it, um, and then increase the difficulty to it because it's a process that takes a bit of time on, on implementing it. Um, so we see a lot of people then yeah, wanting, wanting to work on it. Uh, so I would say 80% of the times they are very open and willing to join, 10% leave and 10 are very difficult to convert. And uh, maybe one, one of the things that, that, um, that we definitely, and actually this changed already in the last two years, what we, what we always use as an argument is that if you put in the risk factor now, how um, if you don't focus on sustainability and climate topics, and um, that risk gets bigger and bigger and bigger on the one hand side to regulation, to the consumers who want to, to do it and for more transparency in the market. So basically kind of the business point that we make is to say, um, you should start doing it now. If not, you will, you will lose also from a business perspective. And this is sometimes how we crack the, the most difficult people who don't want to change. Uh, we cannot hear you right now. Or maybe it's on my side only. Sorry, no, it's on my side. My apologies. So thanks very much. Actually, there is a question, related question, uh, to, that deals with business models. Um, so um, um, a member of the audience asks, uh, how do you actually steer towards net positive business models rather than just uh, compensating for negative uh, effects, the negative uh, carbon footprint? Mm -hmm. So, like, first of all, and I think that is important to say is we see our green pledge, the commitments of the green pledge are completely separate. So any organization who needs to measure and who needs to reduce, they cannot simply um, uh, compensate. So we have like a, a, a reduction kind of goal of at least 20% within the, within, the um, within the first year. And no matter how much you want to compensate, you need to hit the reduction target. And I think that is something in general that is very important to always see, see um, them in a separate way and, um, and also measure them in a separate way that you make sure that they don't compensate only and don't look into the reduction. And we were also, um, to be honest, very openly in the beginning discussing, should we maybe leave the compensation part completely, completely away? Uh, the reason why we decided still to have it as part of our pledge was that we believe if you come from a very privileged position in terms of your wealth, in terms of how you grew up and how you're educated, just only working on the reduction part is not enough, but you need to allocate your resources, which is mostly time and money, also in order to, to, to compensate on this, and therefore we, we added it. Um, maybe one other thought here, we are now kind of discussing if we should kind of make it mandatory to also put part of the compensation in negative carbon technologies that are currently very expensive, and, but that still have the potential to really capture a lot of carbon, and that is something that we open to discuss as well. And uh, sorry, I think I, I, I need to add to the business, business model related topic. Um, so what we do in order to really look into um, how to change the business model is we use the power of our community. So one example that I can take that we are um, actually launching in, in a few weeks is our e-commerce guide. So we have about 150 e-commerce companies and these companies face all the same problems. They all have a supply chain. Then maybe some are platforms, some are even suppliers. So they, they are all looking in the, in the same problems and we are basically bringing them together and try to um, get the knowledge out of their heads how they can make industry specific and business model specific um, changes. And then we basically give this back to, to, to the companies in order to change it. Well, as it happens, uh, there's a question which I think is related to that, uh, and this was addressed to you specifically. Uh, would you hold the digital companies responsible for the carbon footprint that their activity generates? For example, travel platforms. So, so um, uh, this is uh, links up with what you just said. Uh, so, how how would you respond to that? Um, I would I would definitely um, respond. Yes, they are also responsible to it, and therefore we do it like this that. Um, to, in order to reach the first part of our green pledge, they need to look at their emissions. But in order to kind of become a flagship supporter of our initiative, they need to look into also everything related in their business model. And that clearly is if you have a travel platform, 
you need to kind of look into into doing it. And maybe one really great example that I like to mention from us, our community is Zalando. So um, they basically have a huge network of partners. They have a lot of fashion companies, they have a lot of suppliers. And when they looked into their science-based targets, besides of having a better kind of space, having better hosting, they noticed that the big leverage that they can take is to put pressure on their suppliers. So they put out um, the agenda that anyone who needs to, who wants to sell fashion on Zalando needs in 2025 apply science-based targets and have a clear path as well to decarbonize their model. And all of a sudden, hundreds of companies need to kind of look into how to change it. And I think that's the leverage that traveling platforms and many other organizations um, um, can take as well. Um, yeah. But also what is important to, to say is um, it's still only the beginning. So like on a daily, on a daily basis, we are trying to pushing and to motivate and get people involved. And um, yeah, this is a part of what we see in our mission. Thanks very much, Philip. So I have uh, also questions here um, uh, to, to the others. Uh, Sylvia, I would like to turn to you and ask you uh, um, the audience question that uh, relates to data um, and the quality of data. So it depends, uh, AI depends a lot on the quality of training data. Um, how can we make sure that the data are good enough uh, uh, for the use of AI for the planet? Because, of course, if the data are not uh, good, uh, that can have then uh, obviously negative consequences. Yes, yeah, very good question. And I think that question of the quality of data is not only important when it comes to using AI specifically for the planet, but this is like one of the paramount uh, considerations when when kind of a company deals with AI and applies it. So definitely kind of uh, you can um, have due diligence when in terms of labeling, curating, making sure that you kind of have um, uh, data that is representative, um, that kind of, you know, um, uh, leads to a certain outcome that you are trying to achieve. But of course, uh, apart from that, there are a lot of tools uh, uh, that, uh, you know, we have developed as a company that kind of helps you either to visualize and, for instance, detect biases or detect gaps um, but can, that can also kind of help you to, to uh, make those more informed decisions. So, yes, very important to ensure that. And uh, above that, there are also more and more tools that are also in this kind of open source um, uh, library. And I encourage you, for instance, to look at PER. It's, it's a kind of... Um, a team at Google called People and AI, and they have developed and open source a lot of those tools. One of them is, for instance, called Faceits, that allows you to kind of visualize your data sets in a meaningful way to, uh, to help you uh, figure out if the data that you are inputting in a certain model will give you those quality results. Thanks very much. So, uh, still to you, Sylvia. Um, do you um, intend to, to Google, does Google intend to encourage users to uh, use climate oriented machine learning AI solutions? Um, um, are they going to be an option or are they going to be the only way? And in a way, a related question perhaps, um, but a broader, more general question. Does Google know which of their products or services have the largest carbon footprint globally or regionally? Yeah, so maybe on that first uh, consumer driven part. So indeed, that's a kind of an effort to make sure that, you know, all of the products that the company is developing have this sustainability component. So I was a bit uh, telling you about this specific Google Maps example, because that's something to relate it to kind of transportation and traffic. And that's the kind of most tangible way I think all of us kind of uses uh, online maps to, uh, um, to go from one place to another. And a simple first step, which is kind of already implemented, you can, instead of just only car, uh, uh, you know, routes, you can include um, uh, other alternatives and kind of cycling paths. And that has been for on, on maps for many years now. Um, step that it's developing. They are kind of looking at also optimizing uh, based on sustainability, the different um, uh driving uh routes so you always kind of choose the one that is more sustainable and that kind of relates to you know prediction of the traffic but also a latitude of a given given route or like you know uh 
uh, the, the light system. So yes, more and more research, more and more kind of product engineering solutions that can help make uh, also consumers the, those products much more sustainable. And another kind of tool um, that we have also developed, it's called uh, your, uh, your Plan, Your Planet. So each of us can go to that website. You can actually kind of learn uh, how your uh, you know, consumption, how your uh, daily habits can, you know, can be optimized uh, for that. So I also encourage people to check that. But um, largely speaking, um, of course, uh, a lot of innovation coming uh, when it comes to the products. In terms of uh, specific footprint of of uh, products, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be aware of like uh, such a um, uh, those numbers. But definitely, when I was telling you about this kind of moonshot uh, approach, that not only carbon neutral, not only renewable energy, but going twenty four seven carbon free. Essentially, if that you know um, uh, that kind of target is achieved, it will mean that all the kind of data centers uh, that you know power the products that Google is developing and the services. This will mean that every email each of us sends, every kind of question is being asked to Google search or video that is being used. The kind of the source of the energy it will be a clean energy every hour of every day. So in that sort of perspective, if this is kind of being met, uh, that can help us to kind of reduce. Uh, 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 the footprint because you will be actually power, you know, the source of that energy will be clean. So I think that's a much more holistic, much more ambitious, much more scalable way of achieving that. And that's, that's what the company is working towards on. It's not, a, you know, given it's not achieved at this day, but that's the ambition uh, that we have. Thanks. Maybe I'll, I'll turn to Alberto with, with that as well. I mean, do you at Microsoft, have you kind of quantified what are the kind of environmental impacts of your different lines of business yeah so this is this is a big area of work for us actually just to have a clear quantification of where the emissions and the energy consumption is coming from and and it's, it's very interesting because there are some areas in which we are moving to fully use telemetry data so we have a very accurate and real-time information of what is happening there are other areas in which this is more more difficult to do like for example you can imagine the, the whole supply chain of the steel that is being used in a particular data center but we are we are putting a lot of effort into this actually just to be able to have that full traceability so that's essentially what enables us to then take the steps for every particular thing whether it is renewable energy or whether it is plastic in, in the way you wrap a tablet or whether it is the steel that you use when you build a data center so measuring is is yeah, a fundamental first step and, and that's something that we are putting kind of huge teams now to to do yeah. and maybe I, I also have a direct question that just popped on, <laughs> up in my mind uh Luca, if you don't mind i will just quickly address it please go ahead yeah okay cool it goes a bit uh, to, to you Silvia, but also to to you alberto and i think um i would love to know if you have discussed internally as well to kind of think about how you can use your platform in order kind of to motivate companies to reach their climate goals by incentivizing them potentially with better search results so i'm thinking especially on google i mean everyone is there a lot of people search, a lot of advertisers are also putting advertisement out there and giving the ones that maybe reach already the climate pledge, whatever that is, kind of a green symbol next to, to the search result, maybe even increasing their ranking a bit, because that would then have a huge impact uh, on, on all kinds of industries and a direct financial incentive as well to kind of focus on the climate, climate things. And were there any discussions going on in this field? So it's a, it's a it's an interesting concept, not not as far as I as I know, but the so definitely the, the conversation is happening as you know in terms of this is this is not kind of an issue that people is doing on the side. So this has become a fundamental issue for for many many industries, and and we are working with them very closely actually from the point of view of really how do you provide the tooling and the facilities so people can really start this journey more easily. So whether, whether there are other things that could be done on the side in terms of facilitating publicity and, and facilitating actually recognition for the efforts, because that's, that's really what you are suggesting there. So people, people that are doing the right things for the right reasons should be recognized and, and in many ways should be given kind of a, a window for, for doing this. And there may be different ways of doing that. I, I'm not sure which one is the, the optimal way, but definitely 
putting kind of the right tools and creating the journey that is easier and, and faster for people to follow. That's, that's very much what we are doing. That's, that's the main aim for us. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Um, there is a question related to um, digital twins. Um, and I don't know, Alberto, if you want to address this. So is it important to um, have this kind of envisioning strategy through uh, first uh, developing a digital twin that presents the opportunities that AI can facilitate uh, in the future? Is that something um, that you think would be necessary, important, um, or is it nice to have? No, I think I think digital twins could be should be playing a critical role actually in the future. The the way I think of digital twins, because this this is the other thing, different people define them in different ways and, and mean different things when they talk about a digital twin. But for me, a digital twin is essentially a system that enables and facilitates decision making. So it allows you to essentially test a what if a scenario. So if I'm going to make this decision, what is the probability or the expected outcome that I'm going to have, and if I'm going to try a different decision, what is the expected outcome that I, I will have, so I can have a better handling, actually, in the likelihood of my of my decisions and, and the impact of what I do. So from that point of view, the whole integration of the environmental data, all of the, the data that is coming from the European Union, together with the legislation, together with all of these new monitoring kind of activities, together with the machine learning, that's a huge opportunity. So we can really start creating these causality frameworks that, that essentially enable us to do things that otherwise are very, very difficult. And, and I think it definitely changes behavior when people have a better understanding of what is the potential impact of following one path or following another. So, so I, I'm, I'm very positive about them. I would really like to see them actually having a, a very prominent role in the future. Thanks very much. There's a question that I think all of you could perhaps comment on. Um, can tech companies um, um, that offer green AI projects uh, to the public sector, private sector, be actually a reliable green partner when they also market AI services to oil and gas companies? I don't know who wants to start. Uh, Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to start. So the, the main point of view from, from Microsoft is we really want to help everybody on this, on this journey. So we really want to accelerate the transition to a green economy. And, and that's really what we are trying to do. And that's where all of the effort is, is going in, as I was saying, just creating a kind of a, a much easier journey for, for everybody. And, and I think that's something that we have to do, otherwise we will not achieve this really challenging kind of uh, aim of really going into a kind of a, a net zero economy and a fully kind of green economy. So that's, that's really the position that we, are, that we are taking. Yeah, I can second that. I mean, it's not only about kind of our technologies in the digital sector trying to go on that transition, but also kind of how you scale those solutions in all different uh, sort of industries. Uh, so I think that's that's the kind of goal here. So I, I will agree with Alberto. Philip, do you have a view on that? Mm. Yeah, it's I, I think it's 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 difficult in a way. Like we we have decided to adapt a certain red flags whenever we uh, get new members on board, and this is like to be directly in like directly involved in the oil and gas industry and anything related to weapon racism. Uh, not being gender equal or thinking that this is the focus. And as soon as we spot these flags, we um, we don't allow the people to enter. Uh, I think it is uh, though more tricky to look at all the customers they have. Like, for example, if we would have Slack as part of our community, and they are probably having a lot of Slack communities and making a lot of money also with oil and gas companies, this so far we don't review because it's very tricky. Yeah. So... Yeah, I think uh, no real answer. If we don't see the red flags, we, we, cannot, we cannot do anything. Thanks. And um, maybe related to that in general is then um, how you see um, um, 
the challenges of ethics um, discussions, AI ethics discussions uh, in, in this regard. Um, maybe all of you can comment on that. Um, so we have, as you know, in the European Union, we have uh, uh, had an expert who developed uh, ethics guidelines uh, uh, for trustworthy AI. And then recently now in April, we published uh, a proposal for a regulatory framework, which was inspired by the work of that expert group and the, the, the uh, requirements, ethics requirements that they put there. So to what extent do you see the ethics discussions a challenge then in, 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 uh, in your field, in your work, uh, uh, when, when you uh, talk to companies, Philip, or when you are actually uh, developing products uh, and, and uh, uh, developing your, your business, uh, Silvia and Alberto? Yeah, so I think I would pass the question because our core product consists currently not of AI uh, and only like the side project does. So we haven't looked into this in detail. So I think the other ones will probably be the better people to answer. Yes, happy to answer that. And, and uh, we were lucky that we were invited and uh, were actually uh, we had a member of that high level expert group um, that the Commission has set up. So. Uh, definitely speaking, the kind of discussion about ethics uh, is the one that we contributed for the long time. Uh, similarly, like um, you know, Microsoft and other big companies, uh, Google has developed. Uh, and before that discussion actually happened in Brussels, and before the proposal that you have was uh, talking about, since 2017, Google actually has its own AI principles. It's essentially 10, 10 kind of areas, 10 kind of um, goals when it comes to developing and implementing AI. Um, that kind of guides any kind of product decision, any kind of uh, uh, contractual relationship that Google has. But of course, those principles are quite wide. So if you think about, you know, um, one of them would be, for instance, developing AI that is socially beneficial or that doesn't create, uh, you know, bias or reinforce bias. But also importantly, we have those also negative um, uh, kind of red lines uh, saying that, for instance, Google will never develop uh, AI technology that will lead to kind of mass surveillance or breaking the international uh, laws. But um, I mean, as a company, I think we took a decision that, of course, we have our principles and, and apart from having them, we actually implement them in practice. And a lot of kind of examples, I could speak a long time about this, but uh, um, but of course, regulation is an important next step. And I think from that perspective, Commission looking at kind of trying to have uh, kind of guard rails and this kind of principled based approach focusing on those risky areas, I think that kind of makes sense. And in a way, I see certain parallels also kind of seeing sustainability as a part of that ethical discussion that that's a bit of a point that I was trying to make, but I thought focus has been so far in policy discussion very much about the trustworthy human centric element. But I think we can bring also the sustainable element that AI can help when it comes to mitigation adaptation a bit closer to that discussion as well. Yeah, so just, just to quickly follow on what Silvia was, was saying. So same here in Microsoft. So it's, it's hugely important for us to, and, and we have internal boards and so on, just to make sure that AI is reliable and it takes into account issues like diversity and, and, and is really kind of trying to do the right things for the right reasons. But I, I would also link it with the, the element of kind of just transition. And and we are very keen and we have been working a fair bit with the EU Commission and others to really ensure that as part of the kind of the, the Green Deal and the move to kind of a, a green economy, we also have a situation in which we, we don't leave people behind. So we really facilitate actually that the new economy is is kind of bringing benefits to to different areas of society so i think that's going to be a very important thing that is going to be at the forefront of the whole green digital transformation because otherwise yeah we we will not essentially be bringing all of the benefits to everybody and that that has to be an important very important component of this thanks very much we are coming to the end of this session i just very briefly comment on uh, two things which maybe perhaps more for, for me, though at least one of them I could also ask you. So on, uh, there's a question about projects that, that the EU funds in there, which are related to, to uh, uh, sustainable development environment, as, environmental aspects. It's unfortunately not a single site where you can find them uh, because they are funded in different parts of the parts of the funding program. So they are unfortunately not necessarily very easy to find, but uh, um, the projects that we do fund, they are, they are all available. 
um, uh, on a publicly uh, available website, but uh, not in a concentrated fashion. There was a question about uh, the role of embodied AI. Um, this is something I could ask the others, but let me just very briefly ask this, and then I ask uh, the, the, the short sort of final round from the the, the speakers on on one one particular aspect that came up. So this is about embodied AI, uh, robotics using AI and robotics. What changes it will make? So. The, the unit that I represent has robotics and AI in its title, so we are quite uh, sort of uh, familiar with this in many ways. In a way, robotics, uh, embodied AI as we call it, adds a whole new dimension because it brings in the physical uh, interaction dimension. And um, that, of course, adds to complexity, um, but it also means that some of the models that are used, some of the techniques and approaches that are used may be a bit different because because they may be using small data, for example, they may also to some extent be using symbolic AI. Um, so there are a whole new set of challenges in the sense that the physical interaction is a new dimension. Um, um, on the one hand, it also brings, of course, uh, safety aspects in a different way into the, into the frame. And, um, and of course, then the, the approaches are needed. But these are very closely, um, I often say that these are two sides of the same coin. Uh, robotics and AI, and we have a lot of uh, AI-enabled uh, robotics in our funding program, and which has been very successful also worldwide. Uh, so it adds to the complexity, adds a new dimension, and it brings different kinds of scientific and research challenges as well. Let me then, um, um, just to, to wrap this up now, uh, quickly um, comment on one aspect that became clear. Um, I think it was Alberto who said that this is um, team sport. Um, Philip uh, emphasized also the need to have, uh, I think you said, private pledge, uh, and then to have the sort of uh, corporate red pledge, uh, the green pledge conference. So, so the, the message I'm getting from here is that um, everyone needs to do something. No one can do it alone. Um, Perhaps it's limited what every single person and company and operator organization can do, but everyone is needed on board. That's the message I'm getting. Can you can I just have a quick round of comments from all of you on that? So it's Alberto here. So I, I, I would definitely second that and and not only as you say that everybody needs to be involved and, and it's a team sport but we we need to create ways of actually being able to learn from each other very quickly because the the time scales that we have are, are short and therefore the more that we can accelerate this this kind of working together and learning from each other the the easier that it will be tackling this this challenge agreed from from my perspective as well i mean none of the solutions is a silver bullet you need like different uh, solutions uh, and different you know to different problems and <clears throat> that's why in terms of kind of google approaching this this thing we are looking of course at you know our operations and our data centers but there is a dimension of products how you interact with consumers but there is also this dimension of how you scale those solutions to others so definitely working together is key here Yes, and maybe a colorful picture to finish it with. I think like this working together can be done in with the motivation of having a risk scenario that is just horrible. I don't want to picture out what the world will look like in 80 years if, if we don't solve it. So, But what I would like to picture is kind of how amazing the world will look like in 60 years if we are going to manage to solve these problems. Because, of course, on the one hand side, we will... Um, stop the climate collapse but also afterwards we will be able to live in such a better way that will also have social equality gender equality a lot of positive things and uh, living in green cities and if i think about about this kind of world it makes me really excited uh, to come together and solve it and i have the feeling often uh, it's too much about the horrible scenario and i would love to kind of strengthen also this positive scenario where everything runs on on green energy in a green world. Thanks very much indeed. On that positive note, I would like to thank all the panelists uh, very much indeed um, uh, for their contributions, for your contributions. Uh, this was very informative. Um, I'm, I'm sure the audience there is. I see lots of positive comments uh, 
in 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 um, in the, the, the among the questions also for for the information that you have provided. Um, uh, so uh, a very big round of virtual applause to all of you. Um, uh, a big thank you also to the participants, the attendees who have posted questions. I'm afraid we could not go through all the questions. Uh, there were just simply too many of them. Uh, we are already a few minutes over time. Um, but thank you in, indeed uh, for your for your contribution in the form of questions and comments that you have provided. And I do hope that you learned a lot today. I certainly have. And this is thanks to our, our excellent panelists. So um, I hand over to Andrea to uh, just wrap this up. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you so much to, to all of you for the very interesting uh, presentations. Uh, just to, to remind uh, the participants that uh, today we will continue at uh, two o'clock uh, with another session uh, that will focus on high performance computing and digital twins for climate action. So we look uh, forward to welcoming uh, all of you today at uh, two o'clock uh, and uh, don't forget about uh, the the certificates that uh, you can uh, get if you attend uh, more than uh, seven events thanks again to to all of you <laughs>